Thanks, Carmen, and uh, thanks, Ryan and Stacey, for, uh, for setting this one up. Uh, so Ryan's done the cheese. Hopefully, I can deliver some biscuits. <laughs> so, what does this area actually look like on the ground? Uh, like this. Uh, mostly cropping country, uh, often fairly marginal farms. Uh, really what we want to do, as Ryan said, is encourage the exploration industry to go and, and have another look at this area. As he said, no one's really touched the ground for between 20 and 30 years. Uh, we've got Hillgrove exploring slightly further south down on the Pathway Ridge. There's a few companies active right on the margins, the western margins, the Adelaide Fall Belt and the Murray Basin there. Uh, but no one's stepped off into the deeps, so that was really on to us to, uh, to stimulate some, some action. So because we don't have any outcrop in the region, everything relies on geophysics. So what I did last year and, and the year before was compile a new solid geology interpretation based mainly off geophysics, potential field data, uh, sparse jaw hole constraints, and this was a map that I came up with. But as soon as you put a map out there, it's always wrong. It's always going to be superseded by, uh, by data straight away. So the aim of the game was to try and get out there with a the drill rig and prove myself right or wrong, hopefully wrong, because then we'd learn something. So what we can do with some of these maps is feed them into some early stage prospectivity models to give us an idea of where the major structures might be, where we might be able to localise fluid flow, where some of the important reactive rocks might be. So we did this as part of a, a MinX project with SARO and worked, worked on this uh, mineral potential map for sort of copper and moly and gold porphyry style deposits. Uh, and this is what we came up with. But as I said, heavily reliant on the existing data, which in this part of the world is not very much, basically geophysics and someone looking an eye over the geophysics. So state of play for the region, we don't know very much about the basement geology rocks other than drawing a few polygons on a map. So uh, Stacey's project has been adding to the, to the magmatic story. So what are the age and fertility of these uh, intrusive and extrusive rocks? We've also been out there recently and grabbed some legacy samples from the core library and done some work on the sedimentary rocks. Uh, so age and provenance of the, of the sediments through there. And that really feeds in and, and builds the story of the geological framework and evolution. But there's still lots of question marks, which again is why we're drilling. So things started to come together for me uh, six, seven months ago. And I started sketching things out in two and a half, 3D-ish, and coming up with a bunch of cartoons as to how these, these sorts of packages and belts and intrusions all fit in spatially and, and, in, and in time. So this is the kind of thing that we're testing with drilling. Uh, I'm not sure if you're able to see, there's a, a dash box through the center of that region, which is what we were primarily targeting with the drill holes. So a bit of a, a scale reduction exercise and Bringing, in, bringing back in the geophysics is, is targeting exactly which belts we want to see a drill hole into, where will we get the most bang for our buck, where will we get the most information. So this is what we came up with. This is our drill hole plan for the Alawuna drilling area, uh, basically trying to cover an east-west transect uh, with a bit of a step to the north and, and characterising a, a second belt slightly further east. So hopefully that gives a bit, bit of a cross-section, uh, as most of the geophysics suggests that the belts are training north-south. So we've seen some pretty pictures of drill rigs. We don't need to dwell on that. Let's go for our first drill hole. So I'll start in the east and work my way west. Uh, so we've completed uh, five conventional drill holes uh, at the time of putting this presentation together. We had another one finish uh, in the last couple of days, but Obviously, didn't have time to uh, get that into the PowerPoint. So drill hole D01 was targeting a complex magnetic response, uh, which I interpreted to be uh, related to an upper level uh, pluton. And that looks to be what we've got. So somewhere near the intersection of major structures, it uh, looks to be a bit of a demagnetized zone. And we got uh, altered granite uh, and granite diorite, some nice uh, Heavy, well, very enclave rich, uh, which excited some of the guys in the field, which is fantastic, and got some nice sort of uh, chlorite and pyrite salvages through there as well. Stepping up, we twin this one with the, with the CT rig. Uh, the CT rig drilled a vertical hole. The 
DDH1 rig drilled a uh, hole dipping slightly to the east, fairly steeply, and the stratigraphy that we've logged is, is pretty comparable. So depths within, within a few meters of each other, allowing for a bit of, bit of slop up and down the hole, not, not too much, which is really encouraging. And, and backing that up is some of the XRF results that we've seen uh, Ryan present. Uh, they're showing fairly sharp boundaries, which is great to see. And another picture that similar to one Ryan showed, this is what the, the hole looked like, uh, starting uh, on the right hand side with the Loxton sand going down through the Murray group, limestones and marls. There's a greenish unit, which is a bit of a marker at the base of the Murray group, which is uh, the Ettrick formation probably. And then we step down into the Renmark group beneath. Uh, and the four uh, trays on the left hand side of this image are the basement. So we see fairly fresh and unaltered for two, and then a slightly more altered, uh, about 10 meter interval, and then you go back into fresh rock again. Hole two, this is quite an exciting one when it came out of the hole. Severely altered, veined, brecciated granite, uh, very much at structural intersections and targeting a more of a demagnetized zone uh, about a kilometer and a half further west from the first hole. So early indications are that there's a fairly sizable alteration system set there, sort of at the intersection of a north-south and a, and a north-northwest trending uh, structural set. So we got lots of alteration through this hole, which is really encouraging, suggesting there's, there's major fluid flow uh, able to be located on, on some of these structures and, and, uh, and carrying little bits of sulphide here and there, so bits of pyrite and the odd bit of chalcopyrite. It's, uh, it's, it's really over to you guys to find the sulphides. We found that there are big alteration systems and, and fluid flow events and things like that. But uh, there we go, challenge set. Uh, drill hole number three, again, about another kilometre and a half further west, uh, really pinpointed to us that we're, we're, we're in the upper crust, which is great. That's where we want to be for some of these sorts of systems. Uh, we hit volcanics. So I interpreted this to be a magnetic ridge associated with felsic to in intermediate-ish volcanics, and that's pretty much what we got. So fairly flat-lying lavas and, and upper-level sub-volcanic sub intrusions and feeders. Uh, some of these were, were structurally and, and uh, shunted around a little bit and, and localizing some, some uh, maybe flow-top alteration as well as, as well as low-angle structures, which was interesting. So dacite and rhyodacite type uh, lavas and associated subvolcanic intrusions. This hole, uh, I'd done most of my depth basement targeting based on the stratigraphy of the, of the Murray Basin itself. And I had a guess at the basement being at about 220 meters. And the drillers hit something hard at, at 220.2 or something like that. I thought, hey, done good. Uh, it turned out it was a solicified, inter solicified interval of what was probably the Berry Basin. So early Cretaceous, I think, uh, second basin sequence beneath the Murray Basin, which uh, thus far we thought didn't come this far south and probably stopped about 50 to 70 kilometers further north. So we're going to change the map in the cover as well as the basement, which is great. Although slightly deeper drill hole than I would have liked. But uh, yeah, in interesting uh, silicified gravels and, and pyrite nodules in there. Uh, stepping further west again, uh, this hole was targeting a real discrete and, and elongate uh, residual gravity low which I interpreted as probably being a, a bit of a trough. Uh, you see very similar features in Western Victoria associated with the Grampians group uh, being interleaved with bits of the, the Staveley Arc as it's been shunted up through it. But uh, we, we really didn't, exp we, we didn't know. This was the point to, to test that sort of hypothesis. Uh, nothing like that has been intersected in South Australia at all. Uh, and we think we've got uh, I, I guess a, a post delamerian sort of shedding and erosion and redeposition uh, in a probably a steep sided graben. So something like that would, would kind of fit. Uh, we've got yeah, siltstones and sandstones and, and conglomerate-ish uh, units. So that would kind of make sense with a post delamerian sort of uplift and erosion. But again, for, first recognized in South Australia. So again, changing the map. As we step further west, other side of the, uh, the highway out to Loxton, uh, we drilled number six, 
Uh, this was a magnetic ridge at the margin of what I interpret to be of a bit of a back arc. So this is uh, along straight to the north of the Sherlock sort of VMS type uh, deposit that was drilled back in the 90s. Uh, and uh, we got similar sorts of systems. So we got sheared volcanics and volcanic clastic rocks. Uh, we got uh, significant amounts of sulphide in there. There's quite a lot of pyrite and pyrotite and bits of chalcopyrite. Uh, and yeah, quite, quite deformed. So this hole uh, was angled, uh, dipping to the east, uh, expecting that we get sort of steeply west dipping fabrics. And that's what we, we think we're seeing in this hole, which is great. Uh, it sort of reaffirms the interpretation of, a, of, a, of an inverted graben, I guess, uh, which may localize some of these sort of VMS type systems, uh, probably in the back arc to the Stavely zone at this time. Uh, we also twin this hole with the CT rig. Uh, this was the first hole drilled in the program. I'm talking about these, these holes geographically rather than chronologically, because that wouldn't make much sense. But the first bit of basement that we actually turned up in the first two meters, we had a fossil coming out, which was kind of odd and kind of serendipitous and, and very surprising to see out of, uh, out of the CT rig, preserved chips large enough to preserve uh, something as soft and fragile as, as this. So I had no idea what I, was, what I was looking at, no idea about fossils. Uh, so I sent a picture off to a few people and uh, potentially there's been a, an a, uh, early Ordovician type uh, age, loose age constraint on this, which is, which is really, really exciting because we don't have any evidence or didn't have any evidence thus far of, of anything that age uh, in Eastern South Australia. Uh, sitting just below that, that interval of siltstone, we had, uh, again, similar foliated andesitic volcanics that, I saw, that we saw in, in the previous hole, so very similar. You can see the short plug of core, which was uh, the first bit attempted by the CT rig. That's what they got, but even that was really good to give context to the 100 metres or so of chips that came out previously. So, if we feed this back into the interpretation I, I came up with before the program, things are starting to make sense. We're, we're adding to the picture. We are confirming the sorts of rock types uh, in terms of upper level intrusions, volcanics, uh, probably reworked sections post Delamarian into, into steep sided troughs, inverted back arc grabens. That all kind of works. But really, we don't yet have any age constraints on any of these. They're all sort of relative timing, relative chronology. We, need, we needed the samples to be able to prove this right or wrong. Uh, some of the granites could be anywhere between similar things to the 517 or 514 rocks that Stacey's talked about. They could be anywhere down to 400. So up in the Lot Lily Cars belt, where we're targeting next after Christmas, there are porf supposedly porphyry fertile intrusions at around 400 MA. So, we really don't know. Uh, so we will be dating the, a lot of these rocks in due course and uh, refining the story. In terms of uh, feeding this in sort of a prospectivity framework, uh, Wei will give a, a really great talk next on the, on the porphyry uh, style mineralization that we see on the, on the western side, or the western fringe of the Murray Basin. Uh, but really what we can see here is we're, we're where we're targeting major structures, major structural intersections, we are capable of lo localizing fluid flow and alteration systems, some of which are kilometers probably in scale, which is really great to see. Uh, we've got some of the right sorts of, of alteration styles in there too. Uh, we can see I've, uh, uh, Kate Robertson extracted a, a slice out of the Auslamp MT model, which shows that there's connection to connection right the way through the crust by some of these uh, uh, anomalously conductive zones, which is suggesting that these structures are, are big and, and translithospheric or transcrustal at least in their, in their extent, which is the sort of things you want. So the schematic model in their schematic cartoon in the lower right is developed out of the Andes uh, and some of the South American porphyry systems. So basically we're, I, I targeted based on very similar structural intersections and we've, we've got alteration just like that, which is great. Be fantastic to find the deposit along those, along those scales. So summary so far out of five holes, now six, 
Uh, all the, all, as Ryan said, all the data that we're presenting here and that we've got back so far is field data. Uh, it'll obviously take a fair amount of work to uh, nail down the stratigraphy, given there, there really isn't one at the moment. Uh, but in terms of the actual prediction of rock type and relationships, we're, 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 we weren't too far off. Which, was, which is great, but we're, we're also going to be learning new things as we're uh, doing some chemistry, doing some geochronology, doing some thermochronology as well as to when these alteration systems were, were active. Uh, as Wei's going to point out, that the timing of these events is, is really key and not necessarily what you, what you might expect. Uh, what else? Uh, there's not an obvious tectonic fabric in, in several of these rocks, so the first three drill holes were essentially undeformed, apart from some bits of hydrothermal brecciation. So, uh, Stacey presented the, the established framework for the Delamerian origin, which is lots of different structural styles and overprinting relationships of D1, D2, D3. But out here, we, we don't think we're seeing any of that, at least in the, in the first three series of drill holes. So, again, the models need to be updated, and are they ap applicable to this region? Well, probably not. Uh, yeah, I've made the point about uh, the major structures being, being key to localising alteration of fluid flow. And at least with the, the last two drill holes, uh, DO5 and 6, we've uh, essentially expanded the search space for Sherlock-style mineralisation. Uh, that is tracking north from, from Sherlock in, in several discrete belts. And that looks like, as I said, in, inverted type back arc grabbins. So what's next? Uh, well, we, we've got to finish the program first. We've got to finish drilling in the Alawuna area, which hopefully should happen before Christmas. Then we'll be releasing the data in the, in the portal that Ryan showed. Uh, once we've got all that together and, and, and thought about how the ERA process is going to work, we need to parcel up land and then we'll be able to do a 10-minute release in the coming months. Uh, we'll be following uh, all of our sort of collation and, and, and bringing back all the material together uh, with analysis for geochronology, we're doing a bunch of work on the shrimp to establish age and, and relationships between some of the magmatic suites, as well as uh, doing some detrital zircon work. Uh, we'll do some thermochronology as a, a great skill set uh, within the next to, to do that. Uh, and then after Christmas, we'll be drilling in the Kwandong Vale region. Uh, very excited as to how the CT rig is going to go up there. Early indications are it's going to go very well, and uh, we'll get lots of holes and lots of data, which would be fantastic. Uh, working alongside this is some of the work you'll hear about uh, later through Geoscience Australia, which is their Exploring for the Future, uh, Delamere and Kernamona and Darling project, so some large-scale acquisition programs that we're really excited to work with them on, as well as the other state surveys. So. Uh, New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, Delamarion doesn't stop at the borders, and uh, we're looking forward to, to sharing some learnings, really. So, as Carmen alluded to, we've got Liz out in the field still at the moment. She took one for the team and were, was happy to work out there uh, whilst Discovery Day is on, but really a, a team effort. And thanks to all the people mentioned up there, I'm just the lucky one that gets to stand up in front of you and get excited. Thank you.